All the way down to 297. You better think about getting in the LEM or using the LEM system. I'd say this is as serious a situation as we have ever had in manned space flight. We've always called the LEM a good lifeboat under those circumstances. If at any time in the mission, however, the LEM had separated and we had gotten ourselves into a rendezvous situation or uh, the, the command module being around the moon, then what you state is absolutely true. It would, it would be a fatal situation. Tell me you from flight. Go ahead, flight. I want you to get some guys figuring out minimum power in the LEM to sustain life. The accident had occurred 200,000 miles from Earth. Lovell, Swigert, and Hayes rode in the lunar module attached to a lifeless command module. Apollo 13 had started as a mission of scientific exploration. It was now a matter of survival. Since the command module was dead, except for the oxygen and power hoarded for re-entry, the guidance platform of Aquarius, designed to land on and take off from the moon, would have to be used. The first milestone, and I consider this after the accident, I guess, more or less the survival now, the first milestone was to get alignment on the LEM platform. Alignments are important, you know, because uh, without knowing exactly which way the attitude of the spacecraft is in space, there's no way to tell how to burn or how to use the engines of that spacecraft to get the, pro the proper trajectory to come home. In the position we are now on the Earth-Moon plane, we have to go around the, the, uh, the moon to get back if we're going to use the dipped engine. You would have had enough capability with the SPS engine, but of course we don't dare use that now. So we have to go to the back side of the moon and come back. To get into the correct orbit around the moon, the crew had burned out of a trajectory that would automatically bring them back to Earth. They would have to get back onto a safe course toward Earth. He needs to put his uh, throttle to men also, Flight. Throttle to men? Yes, he's at 29% now, roughly. This maneuver again was uh, completed on time, and because it was a manual burn, we had a three-man operation. Jack would uh, take care of the time. He'd tell us when to light off the engine, when to stop it. Fred handled the uh, pitch maneuver, I handled the roll, roll maneuver, and I pushed the buttons to start and stop the engines. Aquarius, you go for the burn. Forty percent. Okay, Aquarius, you're looking good. The first problem was solved. They were back on the path to Earth. But there were many other problems to be solved. From a building at Houston's Manned Spacecraft Center, systems experts coordinated the coast-to-coast -coast effort to get the crew back. One of the big problems was consumables. There would be enough to eat and drink. But in space, there are other factors oxygen to breathe, electrical power to keep the spacecraft alive, water to cool the equipment and keep it operating. What we'll be doing till we get them back on the water is concentrating on everything that is de their, their lives are dependent upon at the moment rather than worrying about the accident because there's nothing we can do about that now. This, it appears at the present time that everything is under control and that uh, we have a safe situation at the moment. Hey, I want to say you guys are doing real good work. So are you guys, Jack. We are about 70 hours from home, and uh, we think we have uh, uh, the situation in control. We've projected the uh, consumables, as I've described, and uh, we have a plan for carrying out the rest of the mission, but uh, uh, there is going to be no relaxation at all as far as that goes from now until splash. There was a key decision to be made before Apollo 13 went behind the moon. Where to bring them down? Their present course would take them to the Indian Ocean, where recovery would be difficult. A burn to bring them home quicker would take them to the Pacific Ocean near the recovery forces. Bringing them home even faster would place them in the South Atlantic, again away from recovery forces. It was decided to take them to the Pacific. We've run uh, these simulators both here and at the Cape and at the contractors that, uh, continuously ever since uh, last night. We've tried to simulate 
virtually everything that we've had the crew to do that uh, that is non-normal that they've done, and uh, we've proven most everything that we've uh, been able to, uh, to run on the simulator prior to passing it up to them. There may be some details we haven't done, but at least we've checked the feasibility of everything we've done, and we'll continue to do that. They passed 137 miles from the moon. For Lovell, it was the second time that he had seen the moon so near. But there was no time for contemplation. There was another critical burn coming. And in Houston, the newsmen poured in to tell an anxious world the story. Shortly after Apollo 13 had separated from the Saturn third stage, the stage had been sent on to a trajectory toward the moon. Its impact would be recorded by the seismometer left by Apollo 12. By the way, uh, Aquarius, we see the results now from uh, 12 seismometer. Looks like your booster just hit the moon and it's uh, rocking it a little bit. Well, at least something worked on this flight. I'm sure glad we didn't have a limb impact, too. Jim, you are go for the burn. Go for the burn. Roger, understand. Go for the burn. Guidance okay? We're good, fine. Control okay? We're okay, fine. Tell me. We're go, fine. Inco okay? We're good, fine. Ground confirms ignition. We're burning 40%. Lawrence Houston, you're looking good. Roger. Shut down. Roger, shut down. I say that was a good burn. Roger, now we want to power down as soon as possible. Understand. To conserve the electric power and cooling water, the crew shut down all but the vital life-sustaining systems of the LEM. I think the LEM spacecraft's in uh, excellent shape, and I think it's fully capable of uh, getting the crew back uh, I think, as we have found before, every time we've put the LEM spacecraft to a test, it's always done much more than it was guaranteed to do, and I think this is a good case in point. Conserve the consumables, cooling water, electric power. The LEM water gun was leaking, and uh, we shut that off. Uh, I guess it leaked about a quart of water, I would, I would estimate. But it took me about two days to get my feet dry. And of course, it is, uh, I think you were all aware that the temperatures were going down in the both vehicles. And uh, uh, it's made for very chilly feet for a couple days. will come back safe. If I may be serious for one moment and ask the entire audience for a moment of prayer for the crewmen of the Apollo 13. We'll hold silence for a moment, please. A stands at 62% and B at 62%. I see we were going a hell of a long time without any sleep. Maybe that's the sort of thinking about getting people back to sleep again because uh, I, uh, I didn't get any sleep last night at all. Command module just slowly kept going down in temperature until I think uh, just prior to reentry. 
uh, it was down to about 38 degrees. And along with that, there was a, a sort of a chilling uh, coldness. The walls were perspiring, the windows were completely wet, and it, uh, it wasn't too healthy. I recall that we went in there to get some hot dogs one day, and it was like leaching into the freezer for the, for the food. But my opinion of how they handled the situation when it happened, they handled it exactly like we'd expect them to. They, they were about as well on top of it as anybody could be who knew on what we knew, knew, which isn't very much, I'll have to admit. But I think they did everything right within the knowledge that was available to us in uh, a timely fashion, which is what uh, all we expected of them. Like they did a beautiful job of it. We actually had a third little sleep restraint, which Fred uh, then put on and buttoned up and kept a little bit warm. The astronauts faced another problem, their own exhaled breath. The lithium hydroxide chemical to take carbon dioxide out of the air was not sufficient in the lunar module. They would have to adapt the canisters from the command module to fit the hoses in the LEM. On the ground, an adapter was fashioned from materials the crew had available in the LEM. Cardboard from a checklist, plastic bags, and tape. After checkout in an environmental chamber, the directions for construction were sent up to Aquarius. At this point in time, I think the uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide was uh, reading about 15 millimeters. And we constructed two of these things and put them online, and I think within an hour, the uh, partial pressure of CO2 was down to two tenths. Well, you see that uh, survival uh, uh, now became one of uh of initiative and ingenuity, and, and it was one which the ground continually helped us uh, for. We had all kinds of people on the ground trying to think of ways of, of extending our lifetime. There would be still another burn, a mid-course correction to get Apollo 13 into the narrow corridor through the atmosphere for a safe return to Earth. We're at burn attitude flight. College. Ignition. Thrust looks good. Shut down. Hang in there, it won't be long. There were moments when I didn't know how much consumables we had, whether we could make it back or not, but uh, uh, in a situation like that, there's only one thing you can do. You just keep going, and uh, you just keep thinking up where you can get more consumables. And uh, so that's exactly what we did. On April 17th, they prepared for re-entry. After a small course correction burn, they jettisoned the damaged service module. Up, up, up. Copy that. And there's one whole side of that big uh, business. Is that right? And the whole panel is blown out, almost from the uh, base to the uh, entrance. It's really a mess. Man, that's unbelievable. Next, they got back into Odyssey to jettison Aquarius prior to entry into the atmosphere. I'm jettison. Okay, copy that. Farewell, Aquarius, and we thank you. Okay, LOS in uh, a minute or a minute and a half. Uh, an entry attitude we'd like on me, Charlie. And welcome home. Thank you. to see Houston standing by over.
I recall, Captain, that when I spoke to you on the phone, you said that you regretted that you were unable to complete your mission. I hereby declare that this was a successful mission. From the start, the exploration of space has been hazardous adventure. The voyage of Apollo 13 dramatized its risks. The men of Apollo 13, by their poise and skill, under the most intense kind of pressure, epitomize the character that accepts danger and surmounts it. Theirs is the spirit that filled America. Your mission served your country. It served to remind us all of our proud heritage of a nation, to remind us that in this age of technicians and scientific marvels, that the individual still counts, that in a crisis, the character of a man or of men will make the difference. GNC, go, surgeon, go, procedures, go, AFD, go, network, go, computer suit, go. Rod, network, give me an amber. RTC on AFD conference. RTC on AFD conference. Okay, all flight controllers, let's play it cool. miles above the moon, Dave Scott and Jim Irwin looked out the window of their lunar module down toward Al Warden in the command module, which had completed its separation maneuver. Beneath them, the 15,000-foot peaks of the lunar Apennine Mountains. Soon they would fly low over those peaks on their way to a landing in a little valley in the mountains of the moon. Coming up on pitch over. 64, okay? Bam, LPD. LPD. Coming right. Out their window, they could see Four the zero. sinuous meanderings of the lunar LPD. canyon LPD. known as Hadley okay. Rill as they brought their lunar module, LPD. called Sign LPD. Falcon, toward its landing. And the beginning of what would be one of LPD. the most LPD. significant LPD. chapters in the history of scientific LPD. exploration. 9% fuel. 200, minus 11. 150, minus 7, minus 6, 120 feet, minus 6, minus 5, 100 feet at 5, 9% fuel, minus 5, 80 at 5, 
Minus three. Sixty at three. Fifty at three. Cross pointers look good. Forty at three. Thirty. Three. Twenty-five. Two. Okay, I've got some left. Seven percent fuel. Twenty at one. Fifteen at one. Minus one. Minus one. Six percent fuel. Ten feet. Minus one. Eight feet. Minus one. Contact. And. Okay, you student, the Falcon is on the plane at Hadley. Roger, roger, Falcon. No denying that, we have contact. Houston, the Hadley base here, tell those geologists in the back room to get ready, because we've really got something for them. Scott and Irwin were located on an undulating plain situated between the Apennines and Hadley Rill. An area selected by the scientists as being one of the most geologically significant sites on the moon. Hey, overhead hatch is open and latch. Two hours after touchdown, Dave Scott stood up in Falcon's upper hatch to survey their landing area. Oh boy, what a view. Uh, I can see uh, Bhutan and Icarus. As Scott stood describing the craters and mountains, we on Earth perhaps did not yet realize the scope and extent of the coming mission. Aboard the lunar module was a small dune buggy-like car called the Lunar Roving Vehicle, or just plain Rover. The astronauts would travel miles in collecting samples and placing and conducting experiments. Uh, there are no sharp, jagged peaks. There are no large boulders apparent anywhere. They would observe the layering of the lunar terrain most clearly seen in the formation 14 miles to the south, called Silver Spur. This layering, later to be observed in the mountains and the rill, gives scientists a direct look at the structure of the moon and a deeper insight as to the significance of the collected samples. The journey of Apollo 15 had begun four days earlier, July 26, 1971. The crew, Dave Scott, spacecraft commander and veteran of Gemini 8 and Apollo 9. Jim Irwin, lunar module pilot, who would explore Hadley Rill and the Apennine Front with Scott. Al Warden, command module pilot, who would remain in lunar orbit operating an extensive array of cameras and experiments and making observations which, when coupled with the surface work of Scott and Irwin, would give the most comprehensive picture of the moon's structure and history ever achieved. We have complete clearance to launch. We are go. 15 seconds, guidance internal. 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start. Engines on. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All engines running. Launch connect. Liftoff. We have liftoff at 9.34 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The tower is clear. And we have a roll program. Second. Precisely on schedule, 9.34 a.m., Apollo 15 lifted from the pad on its way to the moon. And we have a pitch program. Roger. With the exception of a few minor problems, the trip out would be uneventful. Command module Endeavour, carrying the Lunar Module Falcon, would arrive in lunar orbit with Scott's announcement. Hello, Houston. The Endeavour is on station with cargo, and what a fantastic sight. Oh, this is really profound. I'll tell you, this is absolutely mind-boggling up here. Gentlemen, I can well imagine that a foreign planet must be a weird thing to see. July 31st. After a night's rest, Dave Scott descended into the lunar morning. Okay, Houston, as I stand out here in the wonders of the unknown at Hadley, I try to realize there's a fundamental truth to our nature. Man must explore. And this is exploration at its greatest. 
Scott was then joined by Jim Irwin. Their first job was to get the lunar roving vehicle out of its storage bay. Looks like she's coming down okay. No. Hey, can you pull it out a little bit, Jim? Up, up. That looks good. Boy, is this dirt soft. Like soft powder snow. Next, the astronauts tried out the rover. During this test drive, one failure showed up. The rover was designed to steer through both its front and rear wheels. I don't have any front steering, Joe. Like this rear steering, Dave. Yeah. In use, the absence of front wheel steering would hardly be noticed. Then they loaded the equipment they would need for their geological survey and boarded the rover for their first exploration. Okay, we're moving forward, Joe. Roger. They were headed toward St. George Crater, located on a mountain slope above Hadley Rill to the south of the landing site. There would be a stop to collect samples at a smaller crater called Elbow, then arrival at the base of St. George, and a look into Hadley Rill. Oh, look at that. Oh, look back there, Jim. Look at that. That's yeah. beautiful. That is spectacular. This is unreal. The most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Scott then adjusted the television antenna on the rover. A quarter of a million miles away, in Houston's mission control, a flight controller operated the television camera mounted on the rover. Scientists and engineers on Earth could directly monitor the lunar exploration. And those of us at home watching on television felt like the third astronaut on the moon. That looks fairly recent, doesn't it? It sure does. Okay, now we got the fillet, we got the soil, now we need to sample the rock. Yeah. The astronauts began to collect samples and photograph the area. The samples would consist of rocks picked up with a rake-like device, soil samples, selected rocks, and chips taken from boulders. Can you imagine that, Joe? Here sits this rock, and it's been here since before creatures roamed the sea on our little Earth. They would also drive core tubes into the lunar soil to collect contiguous specimens from beneath the surface. But now it was time to return to the lunar module. Not to end this first work period on the lunar surface, but to begin another phase. I can't believe uh, we came over those mountains. <laughs> they, we did. It's just a beautiful little valley. Yeah, those are pretty big mountains to fly over, aren't they? After returning to the LEM to load equipment, they moved to a nearby location to set up a science station similar to those left on previous missions. With the establishment of these experiments, a network of scientific stations was achieved which would allow triangulation of events and give us the ability to locate precisely the origin of lunar events. As they worked, one of their instructions was to throw the packings as far as possible from the site. Dave Scott. I'll give you a demonstration here, Joe. Roger, right on here, Joe. Spectacular demonstration. Oh, well, enough of that. Lovely. What was that a demonstration of, by the way? It started out to be of gravity, and it uh, wound up being of uh, centrifugal force, I think. Using an electric drill, Scott sank a tube into the lunar soil into which a probe would be placed to measure heat flow in the lunar material. The difficulty in drilling would delay placement of the second probe until the next day.
the science station was then activated. And Scott and Irwin closed Falcon's hatch on EVA number one. And Tchaikovsky is big enough so that you do get uh, some, uh, at least optical uh, impressions of uh, the central peak uh, being higher than the ridges, but I think it's just because the, the base is... is 60 big. miles above the moon, Al Warden orbited in the command module Endeavour. Operating experiments, his observations adding to the wealth of scientific data already accumulated. Okay, I'm looking right down on Litro now, and a very interesting thing. It looks like a whole field of uh, small cinder cones down here. The detection of cinder cones, clearly of volcanic origin, helped solve another element of the controversy about how much of the moon was formed by volcanoes and how much by meteoroid impact. Warden was operating a series of experiments in the scientific instrument module. These included a mapping camera to shoot lunar features and simultaneously the star field for accurate location of these features, a panoramic camera, a laser altimeter for accurate topographical mapping, and a series of experiments to analyze the chemical makeup of the lunar crust. In the estimation of a number of scientists, this orbital research station would provide the most important information collected during the mission. Down the ladder to the plains of Hadley. August 1st, Scott and Irwin prepared for their second day on the moon. And as Scott checked the inoperative forward steering of the rover... You know what I bet you did last night, Joe? You let some of those Marshall guys come up here and fix it, didn't you? It works, Dave. Yes, sir. It's working, my friend. Beautiful. Their destination was the base of the Apennine Front. Here they hoped to find some of the basic substance of the lunar highlands. So as we drive uh, up sun here, I can see uh, Mount Hadley, and the linear patterns in it are really remarkable. Then they began the physical sampling of the Apennine Front stopping at four craters in their traverse. Oh, boy. It's a nice little crater in it. It sure is. Okay, Jimmy, let's go to work. Roger. Look at that. Uh, Almost see twinning in there. Guess what we just found? I think we found what we came for. Crystal rock, huh? Yes, sir. You better believe it. To the untrained eye, it looked like just another rock but its large crystals, formed in pairs called twinning, showed it to be a section of primal lunar crust, formed during the earliest history of the solar system, not obliterated by billions of years of impact and lava flow. It was a key to many mysteries. Was the early lunar crust molten? Why differences in color and density between the highlands and lowlands? Nicknamed the Genesis Rock, it stands as a major clue in unraveling the formative processes of the moon, the earth,